Brothers and sisters, let's have another hand for Brother Raymond. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm glad I'm a psychiatrist because I was able to get in and figure out his mind and what he would do. <laughs> and in mine, it's the opposite. He did more Garvey and a little bit of Amos Wilson. I want to do more Amos Wilson and a little bit of Garvey. But that right. makes sense. Balance. How uh, He didn't tell you the exact thing that happened that made this program happen. We were talking on the phone, and I was telling him that I knew Amos, and I was telling him, he was saying about the print shop. I said, oh, no, he had another shop before that on the second floor next to the Apollo Theater. And he said, what, 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 what? And so he said, he says, I love Amos Wilson. He said, Amos Wilson is the ultimate Garveyite. And we had been talking about doing a program before that, but we could never come in. I said, that's it right there. Amos Wilson, the ultimate Garvey. That's how the name came about. So I knew he would start off with the biography that they had in Wikipedia. <laughs> but biography in Wikipedia doesn't really uh, tell you who Amos Wilson is. This is different. This, notice this biography is a little different that I have here. And it's even a little different from what I'll tell you. This is a biography, more or less, I doctored it a little bit, that was in the back of a book that none of you have ever seen. I'll tell you what that is a little bit later. But who is Amos Wilson? A brief bio does not begin to tell us who he really is. He is a master psychologist who still lives because of the perspective he took, because of the sacrifices that he made, because of the dedication that he exhibited as he created these books <clears throat> after books after books and lectures after lectures in which we can get these ideas. No, let's not call them ideas, let's call them concepts. No, let's not call them concepts, let's call them tools. No, let's not call them tools, let's call them weapons. Mm. He created weapons mm. for our people. Massive. What were those weapons for? To liberate ourselves. He was born February 23rd, 1941, the son of Eugenia and Oscar Wilson. Dr. Wilson attended Rowan High School in Hattiesburg and was graduated in May of 1959. He entered Morehouse College in September of 1959 and received the Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. That's what Wikipedia doesn't tell you. They tell you when he graduated, doesn't tell you what it was in. His first degree was in psychology at uh, Morehouse. He worked as a caseworker in New York from 1964 to 1967. He attended the New School for Social Research from 1968 to 1971 and received a master's degree in psychology. Now here's something Wikipedia can't tell you. I spoke to Dr. Donna Richards. How many of you know her? Okay, I was testing. How many people know Dr. Marimba Ani? Same person. Same person. Same person, of course. But see, you, you got to be old to know these things. <laughs> well, Dr. you you told me. I told you. Dr. Ani said that she used to ride on a train with Amos when he was going to the new school. She said she had no idea that all this stuff was up there in his head. One, because he's a humble person. Mm -hmm. He'll ask you questions. He'll talk to you. You'll never have an idea of the depth of his uh, thinking. You can get some idea, but it will come out in its most pure form when he takes pen to paper. Okay, so she didn't have any idea that he had all that insight. But then he began to one of those books. He became an assistant professor in behavioral sciences at Ostos College, where he developed a course on the black family the black family and the black child. That's when he wrote the developmental psychology of the black child, probably in around 1978. That's when he first uh, got it done. Um, he left, and oddly, one of the things that he became a probation officer, well, no, he worked in the Department of Ju Juvenile Justice where he developed a complete training manual for the staff there. And that training manual, he was responsible for training the child care workers, the adolescent counselors, and the departmental uh, administrators. He observed and participated in the development and execution of programs for the rehabilitation of children, quote, and use hell in detention at Spockford up here in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that that's where Dr. Wilson 
one of the places where he first began seeing something that he says in his books. He says that in a system of white supremacy, if you want to know what an institution does, take the name and turn it backwards. If they say, you want to know the department responsible for miseducation, that'd be the education department. Mm. You want to know the department that's responsible for making the people sick, that would be the health department. And if you want to know the, 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 the system or the agency responsible for damaging and injuring our youth, that would be the corrections department. Okay? Uh, 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 uh. So now, after doing that, he, uh, from 1981 to 1986, he returned as an assistant professor at Ostos College and remained there until his death in 1995. Amos was a frequent lecturer and prolific writer. Brother picked that up and showed that at different places. I actually have flyers from some of the places that he lectured, and I'll show those to you a little bit later. He also engaged in establishing several businesses centering around books, sales, writing, publishing, and printing. The first one that I was aware of was on a second floor right next to the uh, Apollo Theater. We may have a special treat here today. Our brother has told me he might stop by. This is the brother that has continued African World Info Systems, the last <laughs> publishing company that Amos had, there's nobody in the world that knows more about Amos Wilson than that brother. And that's Brother Sababu. All right? So if Brother Sababu comes, he can tell you more. He can tell you about Amos's work habits. He told me one time, and I was fascinated. He said, Amos, first thing in the morning, he's going through all the newspapers, all the journals. That's why all his information was always cutting edge. He told me that one time Amos told him, told him I'm going to put this out, and this will hold him for about two years. In other words, and that would give him time to think. You see, Amos was a, a, a deep thinker. He was a person who engaged in deep thought. Um, the first publishing company, though, preceded that bookstore. That was a bookstore on the second floor. And it was also, I'll tell you what it was a little bit later because it relates to Garvey. So far, does that sound familiar? Books, publishing, mm -hmm. yes. uh, printing? Does that yes. sound familiar? Mm -hmm. That's like Marcus Garvey, isn't That's right. it? Okay, I forget my topic. All right, now. The first place where they operated out to put out that book was had a different name. It was called Africana Research Publications, and he did that with a man that lives right around the corner. A man has lectured here a few times. A man that did a course here on math for young youngsters one summer, and by the end of the summer, he not only taught them the math, he taught them the Maidu Netra. All right? That's Attorney Joseph Mack. He, he, for those of you who are in UAM, he was the first executive director of UAM, United African yeah. Movement. He's also an attorney, and we won't go into all of that. But they operated out of Joe Mack's office up on 149th Street and 7th Avenue. Okay, So we see Amos engaged in uh, commerce, as was pointed out. We see him engaged with books. In the bookstore, he had a lecture space. A lecture hall. Does that sound familiar? Uh -huh. Yes. Isn't that something that Mr. Garvey did? Uh -huh. yeah. And in that lecture space, in addition to the books, Amos would give lectures. And it was out of those lectures that he did there and other places. And what I'm going to show you a little bit later, I'm going to show you Amos's handwritten notes. These things are, are, are precise in longhand, and he would write the complete thing out in longhand before he ever gave these lectures. He, he didn't read from them. But, he, I mean, you know, he would read from them from time to time. He would come, but he was thoroughly compared, uh, prepared any time that he came uh, to a lecture. Thoroughly prepared. Does that sound like anybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's right. The Honorable Marcus Garvey. Okay. Now, um, there came a point where he was doing some of those lectures at a place called Black Family Collective. Uh, it was my pleasure to be a part of that organization. I'll tell you about Black Family Collective. One day, I was at a... a uh, bulletin board in the middle of the night, about 2 o'clock in the morning at Harlem Hospital. And I'm putting up a, a flyer, and there's another brother putting up a flyer. And he's putting one up for something black, and I'm putting up one for something black. And it was Dr., at that time his name was Keith Hunter. And my, uh, I was in the Black United front at that particular time. So we looked, we kind of talked a little bit, and, then, and so we'd see each other, and we'd give each other flyers. And there came a point where he wanted to do a program uh, on at the County Cullen Library. Him and his wife, uh, Claudia, they used to go on Saturday mornings on their own. No fanfare, no noise, no nothing. They would go there and teach children to read. I mean, who can be against that, right? 
See, right. that's the kind of things. We need to be finding things we can join on and agree about and do. There's nothing to argue about. Love it. Okay? You want them to grow up to read Marx? I want them to grow up to read Marcus Garvey. Somebody else might want them to grow up and read the Bible, but we all know we want them to read. We know our children are not going anywhere if in 21st century they can't read. So Keith and Claudia would go there to the County Cullen Library and uh, get kids uh, to read, teach kids to read. So what happened was I was one of those people that you talk about with protesting. So I was at the uh, South African Embassy protesting apartheid because I'm going to tell you something. Even with business or whatever, if you're not able to defend it, if you're not able to keep these people from murdering you, What's the point? it don't matter about your business. That's right. Because we've had businesses before. That's right. How many of y'all ever heard of Black Wall Street? Mm -hmm. So, so go home. They will come and drop a bomb out of the sky on your business. Okay? A lot of you said, well, we got to go back to Earth. We got to get our vegetables. And that's true, because they are polluting everything. How many of y'all ever heard of Move? Mm -hmm. Right? They're really? going there on vegetables. They're doing what they do. Drop the bomb out of yep. the sky. And, and Okay? So you've got to have, it, it's not, that's the mistake of the early 20th century and the late 19th century, we must not make. We can't be in these different camps thinking that we have the only perspective. We have a very good perspective. A lot, when they came to get Mr. Garvey, they weren't supposed to be able to get him. You understand what I mean? Sure. When we do this this time, we don't want them to be able to come and get anybody. That's right. All right? We want to be prepared. So we got to thank you. Black power. Back to Black Family Collective. So, I was at that demonstration. They went into a church and they showed a film called The Sun Shall Rise about uh, um, Nelson Mandela. So I went there and I asked, how could you get that film? They said, come down to the embassy. So I went down there and it was a cat named David and Dava. So he said, you want to? I said, yeah, I'd like to show that in Harlem Hospital. So he gave it to me. And I showed it at Harlem Hospital. At the time I'm doing this, Keith is planning this lecture over at County Cullen Library. So we talk. I really, I honestly can't remember. One of the two people he didn't know about. He didn't either, either he didn't know about Amos Wilson or he didn't know about uh, Marimba Ani. But whichever one he didn't know, I said, well, why don't we add this? And so eventually, when I show you the flyer, we had a group of speakers. They included Marimba Ani and Dr. Amos Wilson. So that was the beginning of uh, Black Family Collective. It, did, we didn't set out rules. It just so happened that each person was involved in a project. Each person was involved in a specific project, and so we all got involved with each other's projects. The way I got to use the auditorium was by becoming the president of the union of the interns and residents uh, at uh, Harlem Hospital. It was called the Committee of Interns and Residents. Claudia had read, it had to be Marimba, they didn't know, because uh, now I remember, Claudia had read Amos Wilson's book, The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, and in that, Amos is talking about training parents and teaching mm -hmm. parents. So she started a place called Kazi Place. We would go to different churches. They would let her use the space. And then, so she would teach her children, and she would include African symbology. She tried to do it subliminally. She would have like indinkwa cloth up there. She'd have kenti. She'd have things they didn't know about. And just organically, she would introduce the African culture into their education. But their parents had to come too. Like a parent had to come too. And she would teach the parents. That was Kazi Place. Marimba had this idea of teaching deep African concepts to African children from a very young age. And she called her project African Heritage After School Program. Amos, of course, had his bookstore. I'm working with the union, and I'm we show, we're having lectures every Saturday or every Friday night at Harlem Hospital, uh, in which we had Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Amos Wilson, and all kinds of people like that. And so we call ourselves Black Family Collective. So they would all be, you know, from time to time, we'd all be at uh, um, Kazi Place. From time to time, we'd all be at Ahab. So from time to time... Uh, my wife, my first wife, who was an ancestor now, she and Marimba Ani ran the AHAP every, every day. Uh, eventually, I became president of the whole union for the city for the interns and residents. So now we really had the live, I mean, the auditorium and everything uh, 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 sewn up.
Because one of the big problems you have as you try to organize is that they block your places. If you don't own it, mm -hmm. you see? So that's how we learned with CMOTAC. <coughs> we got to own our spot. That's right. That's right. And we own our Okay, so now enough about that. I'm just trying to tell you a little bit of how I knew Amos and that sort of thing. Uh, Kazi Place, I've covered all of that. All right, the bookstore. Here's another important thing. Ahab, instead of bouncing from church to church, at a certain point they went Clark House, at a certain point they went Convent Church, they, Amos Wilson let them operate out of his bookstore on 125th Street. That's where Marimba Ani's African Heritage After School program operated from the first store that Amos had on 125th Street. Later he moved from there to a prep shop with a guy named Bill Thomas was his business partner at that time. First was Joe Matt, then Bill Thomas, and uh, it was really a brokerage place. From there, I was able to give Amos the contract to make the code cards for when, when you know, in other words, you heard of code, right? Like code blue, code 777, it depends mm -hmm. upon the hospital. When a person has a cardiac arrest, you have to go there and you have to, um, Give, you know, you have to look at the EKG, you have to look at various things, and administer various drugs depending upon what's happening. If a person's in, quote, asystole, you might give them calcium gluconate or something like that. Another, I don't remember all of them now, but you would have a card to remind you. We decided, so we had the enter, and that was the biggest contract Amos ever got at that place. He told me that at, at, the, uh, at the store, at the uh, print shop that he had. So we were all working together. We were in a collective and ultimately, you know, of course, uh, I went on and we, uh, I, that's where I met Betty Dobson. She was the director of public relations at Harlem Hospital. Uh, and we put together the um, um, CMOTAC. Now, all these things are in the manner of Dr. of uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey, including creating institutions that live on that's right. after you pass. That's right. One of the things that happened was that a brother named Savabu came with one of Dr. Uh, Wilson's lectures that he had transcribed and put into a book form, and he was on the computer. Amos was doing his stuff on a typewriter. So when Savabu came, he said, you can do this? And so that's how they got into the publishing, you know, uh, together. That's how Savabu got in, involved in that. So these are just uh, introductory remarks to tell how Amos Wilson uh, parallels with Garvey. We have the businesses. We have the elevating people's minds. We have the self-reliance. Uh, we have the connecting with other people. I was surprised to find out that Garvey connected with about four people in the beginning when he came here. And by, in a month, what did they have? Over a million people? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the power of organizing. That's a fact. Okay. In Amos's book on Garvey, he mentions that he wrote a play about Mr. Garvey. How many of you knew that? Uh, yes, Amos I, I Wilson that, wrote yes. two acts or three acts out of four or two acts out of three of a play. It's unfinished right. on Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. He consciously decided he would kind of introduce the concepts of Mr. Garvey into psychology. So all of his psychology, it wasn't, a, it wasn't something that this kind of happened. It was by design, and it was by forethought, it was by a plan uh, that he did that. So in those ways, what Brother DeGay said is very, very accurate. Amos Wilson was the ultimate Garvey. There are other ways that even have to do with character in which he was like Mr. Garvey. Amos was very frugal, very frugal. He didn't spend a lot of money. He was not, I said, I, I dress today deliberately the way that Amos came to his lectures. He would come with a little sports jacket. Sometimes he put a kufi on, you know. Maybe he put a little piece of kenti around his neck. But he wasn't, he didn't, you know, he didn't spend money on clothes. He didn't spend money on anything. I had the uh, 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 opportunity to pick him up and drop him off a few times where he lived. He lived uh, in a tenement up on uh, Davidson Avenue in the Bronx. All right? Very unassuming. Didn't drive. You know, he, he just... He dedicated himself totally to the work. And I understand that Mr. Garvey sometimes would be without an overcoat, that he wouldn't spend the people's money 
his, he had one of his wives wanted to spend, you know, a lot of money, you know, and he had to put the brakes on her and say, no, 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 we don't do that. So if, with respect to the amount of money that came into his possession, he lived frugally. He lived modestly. Those are things that are similar that we see. From now, the same way you can't talk about Garvey without talking about crumbles, the same way that you can't go without talking about some of the other uh, uh, people that go into the thinking. You can't talk about Amos Wilson without talking about some of these people. I didn't make this slide for this. I made this slide for something else. So what you'll see is, is that one of the people is younger. She was. She really didn't come into prominence. The one on the bottom right hand corner. That's Joy DeGruy. Yeah, she's yeah. from post traumatic post slavery slave syndrome. Uh, yeah, syndrome. Yeah. That's what she she's talks a beast. about. But yeah. I'll tell you this: the first person or the first place I ever saw associated with post traumatic. Uh, uh, slavery syndrome, guess who it was? Dr. Wilson. Amos Wilson. Mm -hmm. And there's an article that they put in, it was in uh, Black, no, Our Times Press. Now, just quickly, I'll try to go through some of these other people. Maulana Karingo, why is he there? He's there because he did something that helped me as a psychiatrist. When I say as a psychiatrist, he put out a book called Introduction to Black Studies. In it, he had a section in which he talked about psychology. He might have called it a different name, but he had all of the great uh, psychologists, and he had them in three categories. He had the uh, traditional, he had the uh, reformers. Now, one of the reformers would be people that would be like Greer, uh, Griggs and uh, Cobbs and Greer. It would be like Poussant and those people. When mm -hmm. Amy, when um, Gil Nope would have his shows, he'd have Poussant over. Poussant, you know, my soul never resonated to the things he was saying. But he had another section with about six psychiatrists. And those uh, and six psychiatrists and psychologists, those he called the radical. I'll point them out to you. Right next to Maulana Karinga, there's one of them. Anybody know who that is? That's Dr. Wade Noble. All right. No, Wade is on the bottom. On the bottom, next yeah. to next to Maulana Karinga. No. Right next to Maulana Karinga, to the right. Oh yeah. To, 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 well, to Maulana Karinga's right. That's the, right. That's my right. anatomical right. right. See, right. for me, that's the left. <laughs> for me, that's the right. When you're looking at the patient, Wait. don't get it mixed up. You cut off the wrong leg or limb or something. Okay. <laughs> that's uh, that's to to Maulana Karinga's right or your left. Right. Okay. Gotcha. The person next. That's Wade Noble. Right. Anybody know his the famous quote for him? I don't think he likes sound bites so much, but about power. About power. Yeah. <laughs> Power is the ability to define reality and have others respond to it as if it were their own. Next to him is another man by the name of uh, Kofi, Kofi Cambon. That's right. I got a psychologist out here. Okay, so Kofi Cambon was another one of those uh, considered in the route. He operates out of Florida. Up above Maulana Karinga, you see Mother Frances Welsing. Big Mama Consciousness. Next to her... You see a man over here on the right from World mm -hmm. War II won a medal for the French. Right. He was a French war hero and then ended up fighting against them, okay, in Algeria. In the daytime, he'd be a psychiatrist, and at night he'd be a psychiatrist, but he'd be helping the rebels. Mm -hmm. And he is very important in the study of post-traumatic stress disorder because he discovered that it struck the perpetrators as well as the victims. He was treating the torturers in the, mo in the morning and the rebels at night. And so uh, those are some of the men. And you see Dr. John Henry Clark in the middle. We skip over to him. That's Bobby Wright. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Bobby Wright, he wrote Psychopathic Racial Personality, in which he explains Europeans to the T. You see included, see I have an expanded idea of psychiatry. I wrote a paper called John Henry Clark, Master Psychiatrist. Don't have time to go through that today, but I will try to read a little piece of it. And then we have the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. If you can cure drug addicts, take criminals and make them uh, productive. acting and productive and, and, and live uh, righteous and moral lives, and, then, and you're a psychologist, okay? Right. Whether they want or not. Up in the right, who knows what that is, the far up, upper right hand corner? That's a person who wrote a French dictionary. He was an African head of state, Leopold Sadar Senghor, and he was, in his youth, a radical. Who knows what literary movement he founded? The Neighbor Two Movement. Leopold Sadar Senghor, Aimé Césaire, and Brother Damas. They were, okay, now the other 
The, the last two psychiatrists, or psychologists, or psychiatrists, well, psychologist means the study of. Iatro, anytime you see that, that means a physician, a pediatrician, right? A, uh, a physiatrist, those are all uh, physicians. So a psychiatrist is a physician, but they pretty much can do many of the same things. <laughs> That's Naeem Akbar. Okay. He should do a column in the Muhammad Speaks. And uh, wrote a book, The Community of Self. And next to that, you see Malefi Asante, who uh, just formalized what Garvey was saying. We have to speak from what? An Afrocentric perspective. You know, you can't say our founding fathers. You're saying our founding fathers, and you would have been uh, my, my, my daughter in school. They tried to get her to do something with George Washington one day, and she came to me, and I said, Baby, do you know what George Washington would do to you? And she knew, because she was in Ahab. She looked, she said, Make me a slave. I said, exactly. Exactly. Make you a slave. Next to him is Amos Wilson, of course, from Reverend I mean, that's That one, I didn't mention his name. That was That's Dr. Robert V. Guthrie. He wrote a book. It's my second favorite uh, book title. It's about the history of, of blacks in psychology. What's it called? Even the, Even the rat, was, rat was white. That's how white psychology was. Even the rat was white. And uh, you can see Greer's name down on the bottom, along with him. Powers of Billy, I told you that already. Stephen Biko, I didn't have him in the picture, because that picture's not comprehensive. How can we have all of the great psychologists and we don't have uh, Dr. Ben? We don't have uh, um, June Pilgrim. We don't have uh, Pat Newton. No, that, that's not comprehensive. But Steve Biko was a medical student, and he but he said a very powerful psychiatric uh, truth. He said, the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the, the mind, mind of the of oppressed. oppressed. That's word. Okay, let me see if I can get rid of this. Bobby Wright. I hope y'all listening. Yeah, we have Bobby Wright on the other I hope y'all taking y'all notes to see as you've seen in this. So, oh, wow, I'm believing now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's Dr. Bobby Wright. Knowledge up, yo. He said, in a bullfight, after being brutalized while making innumerable charges at the movement of a cave, there comes a time when the bull finally turns and faces his adversary with the only movement being his heaving, bloody side. It is believed that for the first time, he really sees the matador. This final confrontation is known as the moment of truth. For the bull, this moment comes too late. Clearly, he's not talking about bulls, is he? Nope. He's not talking about it. He's talking about us. It's a metaphor. That's... Uh, Said from the floor of the Virginia House of Delegates, a uh, white uh, 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 a legislator said, Sir, we have as far as possible closed every avenue by which light may enter their minds. We have only to go one step farther to extinguish the capacity to see the light, and our work will be completed. You see up there? That's what happens to mm -hmm. them when they, they basically can extinguish the light. That's flavor play, right? Mm -hmm. This is Richard uh, King, who explains how melanin or chemware keeps the light from being extinguished. His book was The African Origin of Biological Psychiatry. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Francis Welsing, if you don't understand white supremacy, everything else you understand will only confuse you. confuse you. That's right. That's those people again. All right, now here, this is Marcus Garvey. If you were white, you would see the, see the rest in hell before you would deprive your children of bread to give it to others. You would give that which you do not want, but not that which is to be the sustenance of your family, and so the world thinks. Amos Wilson said it all the time. You know, you're talking about jobs. They, they're having trouble with jobs themselves. They're not going to give you a job. They're going to take the jobs from their children, the food out of their children's mouth, and give it to you? No way. You better do for yourself. That's what Amos Wilson said. That's right. That Showing you the different psychologists only tells you a little bit of what went into Amos Wilson's thinking. How he became this psychologist. And I'll tell you, Amos Wilson would be wealthy if he were an Uncle Tom psychologist. If he'd have been an Uncle Tom psychologist, he would have had, because he was very insightful, he was very understanding, he was very humble, he would have, he would have, he would have made millions. But where did he come from? He came from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Of all the states in the Union, there's no Mississippi has the most in that period of uh, post reconstruction of 581 lynchings in that little bit of time. time. Let's look at the time period with some of the more famous ones that happened, right? 
And Mattel was lynched in 55. It's about that time that Dr. Wilson was graduating from high school, right? That's just a map to show you the lynchings that have occurred all throughout the South. This is, I, we could do a whole lecture on the lynching of women, but all of these are things that happened in Mississippi, and including, the, they, they took, a, this was when they lynched this woman, but they lynched the man who was with her too, and they made him confess. Uh, the way they made him confess was by putting his testicles in a vice and squeezing until, okay? We know that in 1964, which would be about the time when Dr. Wilson's <laughs> choosing, where will I go after I finish Morehouse? Where am I going to practice? We know those people. We know in the middle, that's James Cheney. How many people know what I'm talking about? You all know those mm -hmm. people? That's Shorty sure, Goodman sure. and Cheney. These yeah. are things that happen before some of your lifetime. Now, here's some other famous Mississippi mm -hmm. lynchings that mm -hmm. occurred during Wilson's life. And this is Matt yeah, yeah. Parker, who was lynched in 1959 in Mississippi. That's about the time that Amos Wilson would be finishing uh, uh, high school. Uh, this is um, in the middle, that's James Cheney, that's 60, well, that's, that's yeah, Medgar yeah. Evans, 63. He's finishing exactly the year that Amos finishes Morehouse. Mm -hmm. Where am I going to go? Am I going to go back down to Mississippi and try to practice? Or am I going to get... That, of course, is, is uh, Emmett Till. That's from 1955. Now, this is a map of the counties in Mississippi. Amos is where that one is, all right? So if you want to know, did he know about these things? Mm -hmm. When he was, uh, yeah, he knew about them. Mm -hmm. He knew about uh, 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 number five, where Emmett Till was, because we knew about it up here in New York. This is terrorism. You know how you know about the bombing of the World Trade Center? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're in Mississippi and you're a boy, the age of Emmett Till, you know about what happened up there uh, mm -hmm. in this county where uh, Emmett Till was in. You know about what happened to the civil rights workers in Neshoba County, which is number four. You know about what happened to Matt Parker over there where it is uh, number three, which is probably Lamar. And then certainly you know where about the one that occurred in Pearl River. That's Matt Parker. I'm sorry, it's, it's in number two, Pearl River. That's right next to where Amos Wilson was in Hattiesburg. So these are, in addition to the great black psychologists we had, in addition to Marcus Garvey, we have these lynchings, this terrorism that's going on in uh, the white terrorists. And that's a complete list of the ones. <coughs> not, not in the history of Mississippi. These are the ones that were lynched while Amos Wilson was in high school and college. All of those people. So Amos Wilson would, of course, be interested in the development of psychology of the black child, but he would have a different perspective from many other psychologists. He says the overwhelming power of the white power structure and swift, overreactive tendency to punish black aggression, lynching, right? Its control over resources, its sustained degrading of black self-confidence has produced a very large percentage of blacks, what is referred to as, in blacks, a very, uh, of what is referred to as learned helplessness. The very strong and largely negative control that the white establishment has over black lives has produced among many blacks such a degree of, quote, lack of confidence that a large number of them do not believe that their personal and group status can be improved. So Amos Wilson is studying the same dynamics, the same phenomena that other psychologists, but he's got a whole different perspective on what's causing it, okay? And of course, he's reflected what the Honorable Marcus Garvey said, if you don't have confidence in self, you're twice defeated in the race of life. Amos Wilson said, far more so than any other ethnic child, the shape of the black child's intellect and personality is determined by the concept of race, mm -hmm. race awareness, race politics, economics, propaganda, etc. And psychology, which fails to treat these items as major personality and mental variables, is not adequate to deal with the black child. That's what he said in the development of psychology of the black child. In his book, Understanding Black Adolescent Male Violence, Its Remediation and Prevention, he says, white on black violence, white on black violence, Mac Parker, mm -hmm. Emmett Till, Medgar Evers, white on black violence induces in the African American community a perversive false consciousness, one which interacts with the adolescent crises of black males 
and the socioeconomic conditions which typify inner city communities to spawn criminality and violence. He's saying that white on black violence is what causes black on black violence, mm -hmm. just as Brother Duguay said. And of course, he wrote this one. Good book. If you ain't got it, get it. Again, he's using the terminology of psychology, but he's talking straight politics, straight up Garveyism. He says, black on black violence, that's what they want to talk about all the time, but then he talked about what it came to, is the psychodynamics of black self-annihilation in service of white domination. Mr. Garvey said, at no time in the last 500 years can one point to a single instance of Negroes as a race of haters. You know, these lynchings and that sort of stuff. The now, Amos Wilson says it this way. The biological father is not necessarily the psycho-spiritual father, and it is the psycho-spiritual father who is the father in the truest psychological sense because it is his psychogenic inheritance which actualizes in the body, mind, soul, and behavior of the son. The psycho-spiritual and therefore true psychological father of the violent black-on-black -black criminal is the psychological son of the white-on-black criminal who does the work of the Eurocentric patriarch who sided him. Mm -hmm. Integrated African-African American business communities on both sides of the Atlantic would help immensely to overcome cultural and linguistic barriers as well as barriers of distrust to consummating and operationalizing trade and economic relations. This type of arrangement is not unprecedented in history. By these and other means, the African-American community and the community of African nations can mutually accelerate and motiv motivate each other's uh, co economies in ways similar to the mutual growth and development <coughs> of the economies of Western Europe and the United States. You ever hear Garvey say things like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But that's Amos Wilson there. Mm -hmm. This is just a small little thing. But Amos Wilson always used the phrase, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey used to also use that. Uh, I use that too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Raymond DeGay uses that too. I really had that on the slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, why would he use that phrase? I'm going to tell you why. Listen, look at this phrase. I mean, this is heavy on the bottom of what he says. He says, if you approach your community intelligently, your community and your world are ever anxious to hear and listen to you. That's right. That's right. Making it illegal. Yes, because this one explains something else I'm going to show you about Amos Wilson. If it is not couched in the intelligence that the world demands, nobody will want to hear you. I know that's right. That sounds like God. Think before you Why speak. would the author of the developmental psychology of the black child seek a PhD in 1991? He wrote, he wrote, he demonstrated that he was educated above the ceiling of the white man's knowledge when he wrote the developmental psychology of the black child. And yet he sought a Ph.D. in 1991. He wanted to couch what he was doing in the intelligence that the world demands. He wanted that credential, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so what did he have to go through? This is a book none of you have ever seen. This is Amy Wilson's Ph.D. thesis. And I'm getting close to the end now, so don't, don't, don't give up on it. Here we go. Awakening the Genius of the Black Child, you've seen that. Yeah. seen that picture up there, too. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. This is Amos Wilson in Awakening the Genius of Black Children. There's some indication that the black child's play activity may be schizoid in nature. That's right. Mm -hmm. You got a, a cartoon with all the characters are white or, mm -hmm. or animals. Mm -hmm. No black people in there. You've got dolls that are white. Same thing that Mr. Garvey was talking about. He said there's some indication that the black child's act, uh, play activity may be schizoid in nature is filled with elements of frustration and restrictiveness, which adversely affects his preparation to deal effectively with the world into which he's entering. What affects the readings of comics, the viewing of TV and movies, and the listening of radio have on personal and mental development are discussed and demonstrated that these activities may subtly negate a significant portion of his growth potential. We know that these video games are lessening the ability to concentrate and doing all kinds yes, of certain changing their values. That this is Amos Wilson. The absence of African American dolls, games, and books may subtly help to alienate the child from its ethnic and cultural roots and identity. Marcus Garvey said, God in nature, 
first made us what we are, and then, out of our own created genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Follow always that great law. Let the sky and God be our limit and eternity our measurement. Amos Wilson talks about the Marcus Garvey School, founded in 1975 in Los Angeles, and what he points out is that it's African-centered programs based in curriculum and pedagogical approaches on past and contemporary socio-historical, socio-cultural experiences and future goals of African people the world over on the development of psychology and characteristics. In other words, we gotta, we gotta have black education for black children. Mm -hmm. That's basically what he's saying. Great book. In the falsification of African consciousness. Great book. We have Marcus Garvey saying in, in his writings, the history of a movement, the history of a nation, the history of a race is the guidepost of that movement's destiny and that nation's destiny, that race's destiny. We have Amos Wilson. Remember I showed you a picture of the psychologist. I have Joy Leary included in there. This is why. Past, present, and future are one and the same. When we have been made to believe that the past is separate and in some straight line with it, the future, then we've already been brainwashed That's and right. set up. Our past never forgets us and is never left behind. If you forgot your past, you would not be able to understand me right now. You would not be able to walk or talk. You did not learn to walk and talk and do the things you're doing at the moment you entered here. You learned to do them in the past. Forget that then. Since that is history, leave that behind. You will see that you also have no future. Mm. Past, present, and future are one, and that proposition is at the center of African-centered history and approach. I don't want to be the dead horse. Uh, because I know I've been here for a while, but all of these, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip, I'm just going to show you that these are just similarities in what Marcus Garvey's saying and Amos Wilson. That's his PhD uh, thesis. This is the uh, place he had to go. He had to go to Fordham to get it. I'm going to show you the people that had to approve him. All right? Those are just, that, he, this was so clever, this topic that he picked. He said, if, if he had done this the wrong way, he would have never gotten his PhD. He studied, basically he studied whether or not black and uh, Latino teachers would grade other people differently based on their ethnicity. And in the end he came out with, no, they didn't. What do you think would happen if he'd have done it using white people? Hmm. He'd have said, yes, they did, and what would happen? He wouldn't have, he gotten, wouldn't have gotten his PhD, right? So cleverly he said that. And at the same time, uh, the answer he came up was, no, they aren't. You know? So he didn't. Betray his people. He, did, he just did it. He just, it's, a, it's a meaning. This is his worst book. And I, don't, I think he'd agree with me. This is his PhD thesis. It doesn't, it's written for 1991. It's not a shadow. It's not a shadow of a shadow. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's not a, 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 a scent of a shadow of the developmental psychology of the black child. These are the people whose signatures are on the bottom of his, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the readers. Let's take a look at what they look like. That's one of them right there, Kurt Gessinger, okay? Here's another one right here. This is Dr. Ann Hagen. The other one, the signature was so illegible I couldn't find them. I know these are the right people because they're for them. This is what, this is Amos Wilson's legacy here. You see those boxes? Those boxes are of his books. This is African World Info Systems, and this is being held by one man Instead of people giving him any assistance or saying, hey, I'll volunteer this number of hours, or hey, here's some money so you can expand the business, they come and say, when's the next one coming now? That's what they do to him. That's Brother Sababu. I thought he would be here. He'd be able to tell you a little bit more. See Amos' notebooks? Amos Wilson, by living frugally, he lived in a little, it, water damage, water damage, one of, the, one of the manuscripts we've never seen. Pages, maybe about 20, 30 pages missing from it, from water damage, from living in that little, uh, a tenement place. These are some of the flyers. These are some of the notes. Sometimes he would write them in red to get his uh, important parts across. This is just his, this is his real um, resume and stuff. That's where I got that other information, brother. I'm not no crack researcher. I went <laughs> right to the source and got his stuff. Uh, this is what these are lectures at the House of the Lord Church. That's that first Black Family Conference that I told you about. Mm -hmm. Out of this, we evolved into the Black Family Collective. Uh, I think it was uh, probably, let's see who was there. La Francis Rogers Rose was there. Um, Amos Wilson, of course, was there. 
uh, a brother, Abdul Muhammad. I don't even know who that is now. <clears throat> Sister Jeannie Bain was there. That was one of the... Oh, you Jeannie Bain? Yes. And also uh, uh, Brother Preston Wilcox. Mm -hmm. Brother Preston Wilcox, the first time um, Keith introduced him to me, he, he gave me a little test. He said, um, he said, you know, I think that 95% of uh, white people are racist. You know? so I just stayed shut. He said, you know, he's talking. He said, so what are you thinking? I said, no, I can't agree with you. He said, no, no. He said, why? He said, I, I want to know where the 5% are. <laughs> he laughed and that was it. <laughs> he was the founder of AFRAM. So, see, we, we don't know these people. He and Charles Barron were arrested when they tried to appoint a white curator at the Schomburg Oh gosh. The yeah, uh, Schomburg Jesus. Library. We had the Schomburg Coalition. They used to meet a brother came here last week and talked about how we let them into the hospital with interns and residents because and we used to be out on that corner by the Schomburg. Dr. Clark would be out there. Pork Chop Davis would be out there. Um, those sorts of things. So let's see. I think that's probably the end. We're back to the beginning, brothers and sisters. That's it. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think now, would you be able to take questions? And I think, Brother Duncan, you should too, in case people.